Good. Right. Okay. I think we're coming in now. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us on this very wet and windy here in the UK anyway, Saturday night. Oh, I've just got to do one thing here. Bear Good, we're in. Right, good. So um, uh, say hi, everybody, uh, when you come in. Uh, we've got the amazing Tom Candy here this evening. We've been trying to arrange this for a while, so it's great to kind of get Tom in. And we've got lots to talk about tonight. Um, all good people coming in now. It's great. Uh, yeah, say hi, everybody, as you come in. Well, Tom, it's great to see you. Thanks for thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me. Like like you said, it's good to finally be able to do it. But you know what? I think, Tom, uh, on a personal level, I think... Of all the people I know in the in the industry, I've probably known you as long as anybody, pretty well, because we get yeah, right back yeah, probably, in the yeah. early days. Um, so, uh, and, and it's great. And I have to say, just before we kind of dive in, really, um, I've always found you to be so generous with your time <laughs> and your knowledge, Tom. And uh, in everything I've ever you know been involved with, you've always got involved. If I, if I've asked you, and and just looking back to those early days, I, I think it's really good to have somebody like you who's just so generous with your time and, and your knowledge and and somebody who really you know has experience of dogs on the on the kind of hard edge really have being so involved with with rescue so i just want to say thank you anyway so. oh yeah thanks um, yeah it means a lot uh okay tom well that you know for those uh, who might not know you're very heavily involved in the rescue shelter community you do a lot of education there you work um in rescue as well but just to start us off tell us a little bit about your own backstory and how you ended up uh, working with dogs especially with this passion for rescue or shelter work as our american friends call it yeah definitely so <clears throat> i originally i wanted to be a vet that typical sort of i want to work with animals so i'm going to be a vet back a couple of years ago um and as part of that you know to get into veterinary university at the in the uk you have to have a certain number of weeks work experience so i did a couple of different things kennels veterinary practice and then i started volunteering for a small rescue based in south wales called hope rescue um and the first first thing i ever did with them was going to stand outside pets at home in march in the freezing cold um, but I was given a little dog to look after called Faith, who was a little staffy cross who had quite a lot of hair loss because she'd just recovered from uh, Dermodendric Mange. And my job for the day was to tell her story and raise awareness and raise money for the charity. And that really sort of solidified my passion for rescue. And I was like, right, whatever happens career wise, this is where I want to be. Um, I didn't get into veterinary university. So I went to the University of Lincoln and studied bioveterinary science. And as part of that course, we had some um, behavior lectures. And I was like, yeah, this is this is a bit more me. This is the route I want to go down. So once I finished that course, I studied my MSc in clinical animal behavior at the University of Lincoln as well with, with Daniel Mills and Helen Zulch um, and the amazing access to the clinic there. And then straight after that, I started working at um, Dogs Trust as a training and behavior advisor at one of the centers. So I spent about three years working there day in, day out with the dogs, supporting staff and working with adopters um, and people who are potentially bringing their dogs in. And then from there, I started as a locum training and behavior officer. So I was working across multiple centers where there was gaps in the team or where they needed extra support, um, just filling in for those roles. And then the last five years, I've been a senior training and behavior advisor. So that's where I look after the training and behavior teams in the Southwest region across seven rehoming centers for anything to do with behavior and welfare. So I'm just there for support. We problem solve the dogs, make sure the dogs are on track with their training Um look at what plans are needed to get those dogs into home successfully and safely. And then, as you mentioned, as part of that, I do a lot of staff training, um, conferences, and, yeah, spreading a good word about improving um, behaviour and welfare in shelter, because I think it's such a tricky thing to do. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of my big aim, really, is is to go out and do that. And you've got um, you've set up a, um, a page, haven't you, now, on, uh, on Facebook, Simplifying Shelter Behaviour? Yeah, that's right. So um, that came about because quite a few people sort of mentioned that maybe I should start about doing something. And I was like, no, nope, definitely don't have time for that. Um, and then actually I was doing an interview with Nando Brown and he sort of said it. And then I was like, oh, maybe if Nando, you know, somebody as social media savvy as Nando is suggesting something, maybe it's it's got a bit of legs. So um, 
yeah, I started it to provide free free information related to shelter behavior and training for people working in the industry. Um, and it's actually been a little bit of a godsend, which I didn't really realize at the time I was setting it up. I was, I think I had quite a lot of compassion fatigue and I hadn't really realized. And then mm. starting to put out some more information really got uh, that passion back for me, which is amazing because it's just meant now back in the day job, I'm I'm sort of all guns blazing again, which is really nice. Well, that's um, it's very interesting, isn't it? How sometimes um, connecting with others and providing you know, support for others actually in, in that way can kind of reignite some of that that purpose for us. Uh, so I'm really glad that's happened. And Joe, you know, I, I didn't know about the vet things. I can imagine Tom the vet actually. Tom, I can imagine yeah. you. Know, I don't know what that's about. That's about. Mm. Yeah, I think I'm probably just at the a the, the end of that generation where. The animal job was be a vet and that was it you know mm. they're just starting to see more specialist degrees coming out when i went to uni but i think it predominantly was still kind of focused on the veterinary sector and then by the time i got through the three years i was like oh wait this is a career in its own right and yeah, yeah. done it ever since well actually there's something in common i think with veterinary <clears throat> uh uh with the rescue shelter and that's um that sector's in 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 crisis, really. Actually, I don't think. But we're going to be talking about frustration specifically, because uh, I know that's a topic you, you really want to talk about. But um, I think before we come on to that, I think it's worth giving um, a little bit of time to talk about life in in rescue and shelter at the moment, because I know there's a lot of people in the dog centre care group who are involved in in rescue and shelter work, and it's a tough time at the moment, Tom. Yeah, definitely. I mean, a lot of people in the industry at the minute are referring to it as the perfect storm because we've obviously come out of COVID, gone straight into a cost of living crisis, starting to recover from that. And then obviously the government are making some interesting decisions recently, which is having a further impact. So we've got a lot of people who are struggling to care for their dogs and and keep hold of them and are looking to relinquish for a variety of reasons paired with lots of people not really thinking about getting dogs at the minute and those adoption numbers coming down and that you know anybody even does maths as well as i do knows that those two things don't go together (laughs) more dogs coming in and less dogs going out is never going to be the uh, ideal place that we need to be so it's really tricky at the minute to kind of keep those scales a bit more balanced and um the dogs that are coming in uh, are having quite challenging presentations as well. Yeah, so I definitely think that we're starting to see more more challenging dogs, 100%. And I think what it is, is we expected quite a big fallout as an industry during COVID, and it never really came. And actually what happened was lots of people were at home, lots of people reconsidering things, finding out they weren't going to go back to the office and and kind of identified that as a really good time to get a dog. And we rehomed a lot of dogs during the pandemic uh, across the industry. For, forward that to three years and all of those sort of younger dogs who didn't have much socialization or much of anything during the pandemic because they were only being walked once a day, they weren't having any puppy classes and now reaching adolescence and maturity and we're starting to see some of the negative fallout of that. And obviously that's being passed on to the shelters because people aren't sort of in a position to work with it, which means we're definitely getting more ar- more dogs who struggle with arousal, more frustrated dogs, more dogs who are fearful of things because they haven't been exposed in the right way to things as they've been growing up. Yeah, and I think also we have to ask the question, where did all these puppies come from? all of a sudden when when uh, the demand was there and and that kind of gives a bit of a nod to really poor starts already i think for some of these dogs and i think that you gave a little nod to the kind of excel bully things that are going on at the moment but i think there's there's a there's um we, not just excel bullies but the g- general negative press uh around dogs more widely actually not just that breed I, we've ended up also i think with with zero tolerance anymore of a dog who's just trying to communicate i'm struggling right now uh i find this even working with my own clients especially when i've got dogs of a certain size uh any kind of grumble any growl any bark people are they're just seeing it for what they think of that demonization they're getting from the media 
Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think, firstly, you know what you said about where have all these puppies come from? I think we've really seen that. And it was a conversation I was having with a colleague recently where they were um, asked to assist with um, some dogs that were in a, in a boarding. Sorry, they were being bred from, and then they were taken into to rescue. And it was thirty six Frenchies or something like that. A few years ago, we'd be biting people's hands off for 36 Frenchies because you just know that's going to really boost your rehoming numbers. But at the minute, that's all we've, you know, there's a lot of Frenchies in rescue and we're actually like, oh, what are we supposed to do? Um, so we've seen that huge shift in, in the type of dogs we're getting from a breed perspective as well, um, yeah. which is, yeah, it just means there's been a shift in the challenges that you're facing because obviously now you've got brachycephalic dogs or dogs who are harder to find a muzzle for that's kind of the theme at the minute that i seem to be seeing um which makes it much more tricky and then yeah as you were saying um the tolerance level or, or the risk aversiveness of people seems to have shot up recently and particularly exactly as you said with the media at the minute you know any dog that does wrong is is straight away demonized aren't they yeah I think it is a bit of a perfect storm. <clears throat> I think, um, and something has happened. I don't know whether it's um, just it's just numbers, and therefore you end up seeing increased numbers anyway. But I know when I speak to colleagues and on some of our behavioural forums that we all get kind of involved with, um, uh, an increase in even the even like golden retrievers. There seems to be something about a you know this the, any. Uh, recent golden retrievers that seem to find regulation really difficult daxes dax daxons another one and um, whether it's just the sheer number coming out whether it's an admitted gene pool that's happening whether it's a lot of inbreeding within certain lines it's really hard to know for sure but there's definitely a change isn't there i think that's happened in the last few years how much of that is purely covid i don't know whether there's anything else that's happening in the mix but i think especially for the general public who are still being hit with quite outdated advice with the advent then also of social media and a lot of the people really, really savvy with social media, a, a lot of them are the aversive, almost yeah. abusive style. So the caregivers then are, are, they're the ones who are stuck. So you can see how they end up feeling they have nowhere to turn, but to, but to give that dog to rescue rather than actually finding some proper help. But where do they find that help when they don't know where to look? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it just is the perfect storm, isn't it? Um, and I had a recently we went to um Parliament for the app dog meeting, and the topic question that the speakers were asked to kind of feed back on was um around the dog bite incidents and is it the dogs? And actually, all of the speakers said, Well, it's not the dogs, but you know, it's genetics, but we're responsible for the genetics because we're picking the dogs who are breeding, or all of the things related back to people. And whilst that's kind of true in the the kind of background, I think we do need to recognise that actually, as we've already just talked about, the dogs are fundamentally different at the minute. And because of that, we do need to change our approaches. And exactly like you said, if people then struggle to find people who are going to use up-to-date, modern-based approaches and, and recognise all of the things that these dogs have been through over quite a short period of time you are going to struggle to kind of get those changes that we need to see to have people live more harmoniously with their dogs and to have those better outcomes. Yeah. And I think the difficulty is going to be like, how do we move forward with it? Because taking into account all those things like genetics, upbringing, sensible breeding, appropriate puppy classes, appropriate training, you know, that's a 10, 15 year plan. That's not a, we'll just change it. You know, if, if the government gave, that's all the power right now to ch make all the changes that we would like to see. We're not going to see a difference in a week or two weeks time. So it's a really tricky time at the minute to realize how do we deal with what we're seeing now, but also how do we make sure that this isn't what we're going to be seeing for the future? So yeah. that's a lot of the conversations that are happening at the minute is how do we support those two things? Yeah. <clears throat> and as you say, it's a complex, uh, it's a complex web, really, of, of all sorts of different factors and all sorts of contributory things. Well, thanks for that, Tom. I think it's worth touching on that. And, and to, to all our friends and colleagues who are involved in rescue and shelter, you know, we we, we see you and, and we feel what you're going through at the moment. It's a tough time. And, and uh, for any of the general public listening in, we've got a lot of caregivers in the group. 
I, I think we need to give a lot of understanding to people in rescue at the moment. It's a hard enough job at the best of time. It's extra hard at the moment. And it gets harder, I think, Tom, when you end up with a general public who are just not thoughtful enough about how they interact with people within the rescue sector because that's another thing that i see from the emotional health side of things it's, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of kickback the other way i think um which makes working in that environment even harder you know when it doesn't need to be yeah it's difficult because it's always going to be an emotive place um and that you know brings out different sides of different people doesn't it that's the tricky part yeah <clears throat> yes that's true and i think even even my husband my husband works in a hospice a lot of people know that but um you know during during kind of uh covid and and even now uh it's amazing what it does you know you think in a hospice you, people would just be a bit re- bit respectful and understand the kind of challenges of working in a clinical setting when you're in a pandemic but actually people don't uh so uh so you can get, get just as much abuse there sadly sometimes but um okay tom right so frustration uh we when we were discussing about because there's so so many different things that we could talk because of your knowledge and and expertise but frustration is the one thing that you that you kind of thought yeah frustration is the thing i want to really look at and unpack i think it's a good place to start about why you think that is and and also what you what you feel <clears throat> is a good way to do, to think about frustration and why it is important yeah so i think for me the reason i find frustration so interesting and so important to talk about is there actually is probably actually one of the areas that we know the least about from a sort of scientific background point of view it doesn't have as much re- research as anxiety or fear or you know specific fears like noise phobias or separation related problems frustration is quite a new area really that's just starting to be looked at now why it's so important for me in particular is one of the best definitions that we've got of frustration came from uh, Kevin McPeak's PhD in 2016, which is frustrations an emotional state, which arises when an animal is thwarted from obtaining something that they want or retaining something that they've already got, or where there's barriers to autonomous control or where previous expectations haven't been met. And if we think of those three key areas, that's all stuff that shelter does a really great job of not providing because there are thousands of barriers in shelters. They're in a they're in a kennel. They're on a lead. They're in a run. You know they don't have access to other dogs. They don't have access to the people who are walking around them. We often don't know what those expectations are because we've not lived with that dog before. We don't know how the previous owner treated them, whether they gave them a reward every time they clipped the lead on, and they don't have very much autonomous control when they're in a shelter environment. So we see a lot of frustration. And I think for me, that's why it kind of really resonates with me because we just see so much of it in that environment. I think the difficulty as well as we often don't think about how frustration fits into the problem behaviors that we're seeing because it can be a driver for behavior in its own right, but it often rears its head as well in other situations where there's other emotions. And I think gaining a better understanding of that is how we really help caregivers with dogs who are showing lead reactivity, destructive behaviours, resource guarding, all that sort of stuff that primarily comes from or can primarily come from a frustration background. Now, when you think, when you when you were reading out that definition, you can't help but think of it, any dog and how much of that is missing just for the everyday life period really because actually that isn't just like well this is definition it's nice and uh, this is a definition it's nice and straightforward that's quite all encompassing right yeah it's pretty chunky <laughs> it is and it, and it actually <clears throat> a lot of the stuff i read and my interest is reading a lot of progressive childhood educational psychology and development literature because Again and again and again, I see the the kind of dog world or the, our understanding with dog or animal behavioral science kind of mirroring that eventually, because there's a huge there's huge connections here. And actually, frustration is a big buzzword in childhood educational psychology and development for young children because a lot of the, a lot of behavioral challenges we perceive in children are actually rooted in frustration not being able to communicate need, not being able to get what they're seeking, uh, not having the right apparatus to deal with the lack of outcome from that seeking. 
So uh, it'll be interesting to see um, uh, how much, when we get more study and, and research on frustration in dogs, how much that starts to mirror some of that. But it makes sense when you think about it, Tom, because what we do know is that <clears throat> our seeking circuits, if you like, are, are very powerful. They're, they're on all the time uh, and they get activated once we actually want something. Uh, and then it's already expecting a bit of an outcome from that. Uh, and the big word, I think, from that definition that kept coming up is this notion of agency and autonomy. Yeah. Because um, it's bad enough if you don't get the outcome you seek anyway, because that can make you frustrated. And it's bad enough, even on your own, I do a lot of modeling. And when I when I when I can't get it quite right, that's just me, and I have choice and I have agency. But even that, I find it really, you know, let alone well, I, somebody else telling me how I should do it and and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I, I think we're in a world now which actually moves us more and more into that frustration side of things. Mm. And you know, we've now got really really clear examples that people relate to massively because I remember you know my first mobile phone didn't even connect to the internet and then you had e the mysterious e then you had 3g which at the time set, was super fast and then a few weeks ago uh th three the network in my area was doing work i only had access to 3g and i honestly felt like i had gone back to the dark ages like i couldn't load my barcode to get my parcel from the garage you know i had to do everything in the house on wi-fi and you know, to see that shift even in five years with technology of being patient and waiting for something to load because that's what you're used to, to now us expecting everything to be instant, you know, our, for um, card payments now, you don't have to put your pin in anymore. It's just contactless. You don't even have to touch the reader. Everything in our world is making things easier. But then ultimately, when that changes, we get that frustration. And I think what that means is we are relating a lot more to how our dogs are feeling because straight away you can see that. Whereas before I think we had less to be frustrated by in a way. Yeah. And I think anybody listening now can, can think about something that makes them very frustrated and, and also how that shifts your behavior actually. Uh, and if it carried on for long enough, how it would affect your mood actually. Um so it's a powerful thing then, isn't it, frustration? And uh, it's interesting for me because in human terms, especially, f frustration is often um, dismissed, actually, and and, and, of and often negatively labelled uh, without it being seen as, you know, like, say, if, if we have, um, if we think of anxiety or, or that kind of thing, we tend to think about that more seriously or, that's, or fear or all these kind of things. Whereas uh, I think it's very easy to dismiss frustration. I think that happens a lot when we think about working with dogs actually and it's the one word that is really important if we're going to look at having a truly dog-centric approach because those those innate needs for the dog the intrinsic motivations that that dog has especially when we think about some of the breed specific stuff we can come on to that in a minute if those outcomes aren't being able to be played out that we've got a dog who some of them might be in a perpetual state of frustration yeah, and I think frustration is that perfect example of the that in, um, evolutionary thing being misused in, in the world that we've put dogs into. Because if we think of what frustration is there to do, it's to make us try harder, it's to make us do better, it's to make us push further to get access to that thing we wanted. So from an evolutionary point of view, that's massively important because that's the reason that you keep chasing the deer or you keep trying to reach that item that you want to do something with but what we do now is we don't provide ways for the dogs to learn to cope with frustration we often don't provide outlets for that frustration and it just builds and builds and builds with nowhere to go because generally speaking the needs are met by us feeding them or you know we take them out for a walk and we don't provide appropriate outlets for the frustration to to leave so we've got this really clear um evolutionary need which is there to do a really good thing that we're just massively not utilizing or harnessing and what um uh describe some ways that frustration can present itself then uh in dogs whether that's in in the shelter or in the in the home environment yeah so the ones that 
I think the classic examples that I like to think of is if we think of a dog's behavior on a lead. So they see another dog on a lead that they want to get to, and that could be for a variety of reasons, but the lead is stopping them. And at the lowest level, what we might see is some sort of appeasement gestures, so some lip licks, some eye rolls, some head turns, things like that. You might start to see some padding of the feet, that little dance that dogs sometimes want to do when they want something and it's not coming quick enough. So their feet start to go, their body starts to go. They might start breathing a bit more. And as that builds and builds, that might lead to us then starting to see some reactivity. So that might be lunging or barking towards the other dog. Um, and at, at its worst, it could then lead to sort of redirected behaviours where that focus has gone from the item that they're trying to get to back to the thing that's stopping them getting it, which is, you know, might be grabbing at the lead or grabbing at the handler. So you, I like that example because it gives you the breadth of things that we can see in frustration as that dog tries harder and the frustration builds. And uh, that can then because of the things that we have historically looked for when we try and label behavioral responses that can easily look like a dog who's acting fearfully or aggressively or whatever other label we might want to put on and then we can end up doing a lot of work on what we perceive to be you know because we're just looking at that behavior change without actually thinking about the core problem for that dog is is the frustration where that frustration comes from and also how frustration builds over time it doesn't have to be in the moment. Uh, going back to the childhood, the child, the ch human child um, studies and stuff, there's a, a lot of stuff now looking at how connected frustration is and the notion of a tantrum, if you like, at the end of that, which isn't about the child not because the child wants the chocolate and the, the mom said no, the child then has a tantrum. It's not actually about that. It's about a whole day's worth of not having choice, actually. And actually, just by giving a child choice, like, do you want the red cup, blue cup? Do you want this cup? Do you want that cup? Do you want to wear these clothes or not? A lot of these studies have shown that the, the incidences of that kind of more frustration-based behaviours reduces hugely. And you can imagine that with the life of a dog, Tom, with the amount of stuff that we control, not just physically, but behaviourally for them. Yeah, I think, well, actually, you've just made me think of it, and it's not really clicked for me before, but even when we think of the classic trigger stacking examples, often it's, you know, the dog is another dog rushes up to a dog on a morning walk and then they put in the car and they don't really like the car. And then they go to the vet and they don't like the vet. And then they get home and a visitor comes around and then they end up biting the visitor because of all of those things. But actually, yeah, your example of that sort of buildup of tantrum could be exactly the same in that trigger stacking example, but often we just relate it back to a bite or fear and less about frustration. Um, and I think it's tricky because frustration is also something that we see that appears next to fear. And a lot of the time it's based around that lack of, avo uh, lack of avoidance or lack of escape where you then got those two, difficult emotions working together because you've got an animal who's really worried about a stimuli could be another dog could be a person they're unable to get away because they're on the lead they're unable to increase distance so the frustration peaks and that's where you get that sort of avert distance increasing behaviors which some people might label as aggression um to get that other thing to move away because that control has gone from the dog so it becomes a really tricky emotion because it's it's often there and even from um sort of the anatomy of the brain point of view it sits right in the middle of the two hemispheres so we often think of positive valence or positive emotions being on one side of the brain negatives being on the other and the center that actually sort of influences frustration or the rage system if you're using the pancepts model is smack bang in the middle because evolutionary wise it started as a kind of seeking based thing and it's actually now kind of almost transferred over to something that at the end point can be quite negative for the animal. This is really important, isn't it? Especially if you start thinking about that notion of core affect space. Uh, uh, and for those, I don't think we could even go over it too much, but, anybody, but um, basically if you imagine it plotted on a, on a chart, you've got, like you say, positive, uh, negative to positive valence, which is, and then um, arousal up and down, and you plot around that. Uh, but um, uh, that's 
understanding this, Tom, is so important because going into thinking about doing a normal kind of counter conditioning or, or whatever it is approach, when we're actually dealing with something which is more based in a mood state and a potentially a pessimistic outlook now because of the fact that those outcomes aren't being met, we're kind of looking at it from the wrong end. And that's why I think it can be, and guess what? We can add even more, even more frustration, right? Because, um, and, and I think looking at the Panscape model is an interesting thing because I think it does, um, just because of the because the way the, the the terms that are used for the different circuits, it helps us to visualize this because those seeking circuits, if they don't find that outcome, that they are they are likely or might activate what th those rage circuits. You say rage is quite a powerful word. I know yeah. but frustration comes into that, and actually, um, uh, I, I've been doing the mirror practitioner course with Karen Panier, which has been really great looking at a lot of this stuff. But um, Karen, sh Karen shared a great example of this to think about this. If you all go driving around a car park trying to find a parking space and then you come across one, so your seeking circuits have now found the space, they are, they are predicting that outcome and you wait for the person to pull out. But then before you can go in, some bugger's gone and gone in for you, your rage circuits will take over. That frustration will take over. And as we know, fear and rage, if you want to look at this, they both inhabit the same part of core affect space. Uh, and, and so that frustration can flip a dog from trying to seek an exit, seek a withdrawal, but flip into that thing, I, I can't do what I need to do here. So, and, and it's more likely to offer us that more offensive behavior. Yeah, definitely. And I think, your example there actually fits in quite well to what we've talked about in terms of making sure that our plans are as effective as possible. Because if you've got a dog who actually wants to um, decrease distance, wants to get closer to something, and we work a lot on, you know, getting the dog to follow us away or move further away, sometimes that can then be more frustrating for the dog, like you said, and actually we'll probably still get a positive outcome from that, but it'll take a lot longer than if we recognize actually the dog wants to get closer. And one of my favorite exercises for starting to build some frustration tolerance or to teach the dog away from that stimuli that, you know, engaging with us is, is a really great thing to do is where you have a bowl at a distance with some food in. As soon as the dog looks at you, you run towards the bowl and the dog gets access to that food. And, you know, you start at a big distance. So it's super easy for that dog to look away and then you gradually get closer and closer. Um, and obviously it should still be fairly easy for the dog, but as you get closer, it is going to be more difficult or you might have higher value rewards in the bowl and that dog is still learning, right? Engaging with my handler means I get access to the thing that I want, which is great. And then what we can do is link that up to um moving away so you've got a move towards and a move to away on cue so like a say hello say goodbye or today not today whatever you want to use um which then gives you the ability to you know if you're out on a walk and your dog wants to say hi to another dog and it's appropriate you can give that they engage with you and then you can give them the cue to go and sniff that other dog for a couple of seconds before you move on or they engage with you you know, the other owner says, oh, my dog's a bit worried. And you say, right, no worries. You give you not today cue and the dog comes away with you and we reward them with food, which is yeah. possibly less powerful than the interaction, but overall is going to give that dog much clearer instructions around, I can go and play with that other dog or I need to keep my distance. And a lot of the times I think we miss that because we're constantly trying to get the dog to um, focus on us, disengage from the dog, which might not be what they want to do. And that's an interesting point. I love that little um, game or mechanic or whatever you want to call it, because one of the antidotes to frustration a little bit is predictability. It's the brain knowing what outcome might be available. And also, more importantly, I suppose, in, in the case of frustration, what outcome isn't available now. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think it's tricky to do though isn't it that's the problem when we can't have those conversations with our dogs and that's why i like to do as you know lots of different exercises around frustration so that when you are in a situation that's slightly more difficult to manage you don't have control of that other dog that yeah. dog has that learning history of being able to tolerate frustration and getting that arousal to build but then not tip over into 
um, being too much or or getting over aroused. And I think the to- you know the toy play example is another great one that demonstrates frustration tolerance really nicely because we can start with doing a little bit of toy play, build that arousal, stop, do some scatter feeding, do something else, and build and build and build. And we're just continuously reinforcing those circuits in the brain, that learning history of being able to build that arousal, but not reaching that point of being frustrated and then that having to come out in your behavior. Yeah, and I think the reason, yeah, and, and I think this is part of the, again, why I, I, I think this is such a, a brilliant topic and we could probably spend hours on it because there's so many threads to it. But um, I think the, the thing that makes it, challenging is just on a general kind of um once something can't have it basis we can look at these different things that we can do through training and build up to build some of those abilities for the dog to have more predictability there and, and have some more you know abilities to deal with the frustration when we're talking about things that are rooted more in safety and emotional safety and social safety that's where it gets trickier because if it's a really important part of that dog survival story that this this and this i need this to kind of happen that way and they can't access that that is something that will just keep bubbling up all the time. Uh, uh, and also, I think, uh, and I, I'll come back to that in a second, because I wanted to think about how this works in rescue, especially. But but also, I think we have to recognise a lot of the dogs I meet that are presenting with frustration kind of um, type um, presentations. It isn't because they haven't got good frustration control whatever it is it's because some of the intrinsic stuff for them as a breed you know that very kind of breed specific type stuff just isn't getting an outlet and that's a hard thing to cork isn't it to put a cork in i think yeah so so when do you get these other behaviors that seem quite random and quite scattered but they're very heavily related to not having those type based outlets yeah and i think that is tricky isn't it because we've we've chosen that over years and years of of um selective breeding to have the collies that'll go all day to chase things and herd things and control movement or the the cocker spaniels that are just going to pick up everything because they don't have a way of of focusing that behavior and that as you said becomes more tricky in a shelter environment because we're not always aware of what outlets they've had previously or often when you're in an area that you don't have much control over, you're a bit anxious about because the predictability isn't there, we're more likely to fall back on those circuits that are there from the start. So our genetic makeup is largely going to have a bigger impact on us when we're in those situations versus if we're in our own space, we're comfortable, we're confident, we know what's happening. You know, Things that we might have learned are probably going to fit into place a bit more there versus when we're worried, unsure, don't have that predictability, we're just going to go back to basics. And I think that's, I think you're right. We then start to see more of those behaviors coming out because that's what the dogs know what to do or feel they need to do. And then if we don't harness that appropriately or recognize that, that's where you're going to start to get that clash of emotions. Yeah, I love that clash of emotions because it really is, I think. There's a lot of things, and and especially when we're trying to kind of manage and control a lot of things through training and 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 kind of setting boundaries and rules in the home and there's this I, mean, I look at molly for example our young dog and when we think about in notions of that kind of hedonic budget the stuff that the good stuff that we just feel we have to do because that's what we like to do and i think about my modeling you know and how important that is for me for example with molly she does some crazy stuff tom but i just know it's stuff <laughs> that makes her that she just needs to do it and if i if i suppress that too much um, people, t- I, I heard somebody gave a, a, a quite an impassioned talk the other day about the importance of boundary setting, and and boundaries are important, of course they are, but uh, but they shouldn't be barriers to unmet need, and especially intrinsic stuff. And I think we've just got to f- look at the balance. And I think this is another byproduct of for the general public, especially Tom, who have been convinced over the last twenty or thirty years that the most important thing is a well trained obedient dog, with, with the emphasis on obedience, you know, as in compliance. Uh, and there's hardly any wriggle room now for that dog to be the dog they need to be. So it's no wonder they get frustrated because frustration isn't just about trying to get away from the bad stuff or whatever else. It's just getting the chance to do the stuff that you feel you want to do. Yeah, I think that's really, a really interesting point, isn't it? And a long time ago when I used to run classes, 
or help with classes, we did a more traditional sort of obedience based class and we did a life skills class. And you could see the difference in those puppies based off you know, what you've just said. One class is very much about teaching behaviors based on cues, the owner asking for things. The others is about giving the dogs skill and experience to make their own choices, which fit well into our lives. And I think the where the issue comes about is where we have those cases and we're not providing appropriate outlets for the behaviors or the needs of the dogs. So they find their own thing to do. And that's where the problems arise for people, isn't it? And um, because we know, and I know you know, problem behavior is the word that's used quite a lot of times, but the behavior is only a problem to us, to people. Yes. Often, it, some cases it might be slightly different, but the majority of type cases, the person that's calling you or the person that's brought their dog into me in the rescue is because their behavior is a problem for them, not necessarily a problem for the dog. The dog's just doing what? they need to do in that situation um so i think yeah i think the big part of it of, of minimizing frustration like you said is recognizing what the dog is wanting to do and then harness it appropriately rather than trying to to squash it or completely remove it and that's the important point tom because <clears throat> on the one hand we can think about things we can do especially with a dog who is kind of in a more neutral learning state to learn how to deal more with more frustration if we have in front of us a dog who is struggling with multiple presentations because it's foundated in frustration, if we don't try and identify what it is that dog needs in order to kind of mm, let that kind of nervous system response settle more in that, we could potentially just make it be, be making them more frustrated. <laughs> that's the that's the that's the kind of um, irony there, isn't it? Yeah, and then what you're also fighting against is learning history. So the re you know, if we think about the reason frustration's there, it's there to invigorate behavior, to make us try harder to get the outcome that we want. So once the dog does something which based off frustration, but it works, the reward profile of that happening is massive. Um, and that just builds and builds that behavior. So a classic example that we see in shelter is, is lead dragging so, or the dog grabbing the lead and then shaking it. You know, I learned when I did my first, uh, presentation for americans that that isn't a common phrase uh, Stella um, fisher said that to me the other day i was i, was, I had lunch with sarah the day and she said in america they don't even see that. Don't even have that. Yeah. yeah i know and then i spent far too long thinking about where it's probably come from and then i think it's probably to do with where we have rags or old cloths that we yeah. use for cleaning and if you think mm -hmm. of a cleaning motion of a window that back and forth movement is kind of the same thing isn't it but anyway yeah, tangent. Anyway. Mm -hmm. um <laughs> So where you've got a dog who's then lead ragging or shaking the lead because they don't want to go back to their kennel or they want to uh, go in a run, the learning history there is massive. So the next time you don't have as much build up to that behavior because the dog's already learned that's a great thing to do to get the outcome that I want. So straight yeah, away you get much more of a build up and you lose that opportunity to redirect or reward or other behaviors earlier on. So that's part of the difficulty with frustration is the reward basis of being frustrated and then getting a positive outcome is much bigger than a lot of the other behaviors that we're working with. And we see that even with us, right? Because uh, using the kind of analogy early with the car cutting in front of you and then you're beeping your horn and you're using some fruity language, there's a, there is a relieving component to that. It, it gives us something and, uh, and, uh, uh, and lead ragging is a good one because like you say th there is a relieving element there for the dog so they're going to go straight to it um so let's think about this then so frustration then is so important and actually listening to you talking tom uh i think we can it's one of those one of the those kind of rare concepts really that we could probably perceive in many behavioral presentations whether it's the primary thing or whether it's just a byproduct of um uh so it is it, rather than being something on the fringe it's probably really fundamental actually we understand this stuff so as you alluded to right at the beginning this poses extra uh challenges then for rescue and shelter because uh just you know the dog probably doesn't even want to be there like that's probably frustrating enough and, and everything else so how do you go about considering this then? And what kind of advice do you give to, to colleagues when thinking about this 
from a foundational element when you're actually working with these dogs in their day-to-day lives at the rescue? Yeah, it's a really good point. And I think a lot of what we talked about applies straight across and so making sure those base needs are met. Um, and I really like the the hierarchy of dog needs model, which I know uh, you use as well from uh, Linda Michaels, where we're making sure that before we've even got to thinking about changing behavior, that cognitive need, we're working, making sure that the biological needs are met, social needs, um, and the other ones that form that pyramid. So that always has to be our starting point. You know, this it's a true behavior that we need a proper holistic approach to. And then the way that I like to approach, you know, when we have problem behaviors or we're looking at something that we need to change is using the free R model. So where we're risk assessing, so making sure that we have an understanding of the behavior, what does that look like? Is the dog posing a risk to staff or um, public or other dogs or whatever it is, just so that we know what we're needing to mitigate against. Then we look at our management, so restricting the behavior, but you know, we like an acronym as dog trainers, don't we? So restrict rather than management. Um where you're then looking at what mitigation can we put in place? So do we need two handlers? Do we need to use target bowls? How do we prevent the dog reaching that point of being frustrated and that behavior happening? And then our final R is our resolve. So how do we look at actually changing the emotion? And as we've just alluded to, you know, you're never going to get massive success with that unless we've um, addressed the core needs of that dog. We've provided that safety. We've provided different outlets for behavior and then we can look at is there specific triggers that are causing the frustration what's the general frustration tolerance like and how can we combine those two things through desensitization count conditioning or whatever model you want to use um to change that fundamental emotion or that driver for the behavior so that the dog doesn't feel like that anymore and therefore doesn't need to show the behavior or if they do they've got more appropriate alternatives to show I love this, Tom, because um, you know, you're you're really uh you know, you're a real mm, great advocate for working in this kind of way within rescue. There is a lot in and and, and I'm I'm I really hope a lot of people in rescue can like hear this who, who are working in especially in, in, in smaller operations, because there is still a very task orientated approach in a lot of rescues and shelters. Uh, but you're talking about a very much a care relate uh, care relational approach. Um, still looking at tasks, but making sure those care aspects are done first. Because I think uh, you know, having gone around and spoken to some rescues around the country myself, um, actually a task oriented approach, in my experience and and hearing uh, the 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 kind of um, testimonies of colleagues, is that's more likely to get you bitten actually. If yeah. you're thinking, right, I'm going to go in there, we're going to do this, I'm going to have this very kind of clear view of my mind about what the training is going to look like. When you have an animal who is who is really unstable at that point and actually has other more important intrinsic needs and intrinsic motivations, regardless of what you want to do extrinsically, I think. I think part of the difficulty is in the shelter or rescue, you're always chasing time. So <laughs> there's always more dogs that need you than you have time for you're always kind of chomping at the bit to achieve that goal. So whether it's right, okay, to mitigate the risk, the dog needs to be muscle trained because then if he goes home and he's lunging and barking at dogs, we can't cause any or less injury. So, you know, at rescue, we become very goal focused because that's how you get the dogs out. So they need to achieve X, Y, Z, then they can go on the website, then we can rehome them, then we can help the next dog. So, Sorry, I've had, I think I've had COVID this week. So it's just oh, on the tail end of it. Um, um, so that's, you know, that's how we help the next dog. And that's how we move dogs through the system. But it's getting people to realize that sometimes that takes longer because the dog's not in the right learning state. They're not able to progress with that BMP. And actually addressing a lot of the other factors might make the behavior less present anyway because the dog feels safer they know alternative ways to gain access to reinforcement they know different ways to feel better and that changes the the prospect anyway so i've had you know conversations a lot where we're struggling with muzzle training but actually the dog hasn't lunged at anybody or bitten anybody or had any negative interaction with somebody for ages months and months and months and then you start to think well do you, you know at what point do they need the muzzle so we still continue with that muzzle training but 
you kind of recognize that actually the dog's feeling much better. They're not showing those behaviors and that risk mitigation has changed. So it's tricky because we, we want to be goal focused, but we need to realize that not being actually makes things progress quicker. Most of the time, um, it's quite easy for me because I'm also quite a lazy trainer. So anything that I can avoid doing, I'm definitely going to. So if I can change a few things and that's going to make the dog feel better and that's going to help me improve the dog, I'm definitely going to take that route because I am not an I'm not an amazing dog trainer. I'm not a you know, I'm not very technical. I don't I'm not 200 treat, treats with a clicker in in 10 minutes or anything. Um, so for me, it's about how do I get that dog in the best place to learn so that as a partnership, we can move you through the system as quick as possible. I love that. I love the partnership bit because uh, I've got a little saying, which is um, care first and task does follow. And I think that's what you're saying there, because it's, it's, it can be very easy. There's somebody called um, Jerry Lee Kroll, who's a um, clinical social worker in America, who works a lot with children in the um, foster system uh and uh jerry says you know there's a difference between quiet and compliant and calm and well regulated and the risk is that we get a dog who we do all the ticky box stuff uh and we manage to kind of uh soften those edges enough so they go to a new home but they're probably going to come back again if we haven't really supported that dog or even identified for that dog some of those core safety and relief needs really and i think that's important and sometimes it's the, it is the little things that can make a big difference for a dog um so i so i hear you on that and, and i and i would agree with you on the uh you know um i think i think it's a but we always have to be mindful uh about the about getting which is only my opinion getting too sucked in onto the geekiness of training from a learning theory point of view because we run the risk of thinking i i'm so good at manipulating behavior in another regardless of what i, I method i use that that is my goal and if you Think about it, uh, mood, emotions, feelings, behavior, consequences. Mother Nature's knitted those five things together, actually. But through, for some reason with dogs, especially dog training more traditionally, we've detached behavior and consequence from the other three. So we just we just kind of reside in, in behavior, consequence, behavior, consequence. Uh, and that's a problem because the consequence of that <laughs> is potentially a dog whose core needs aren't gonna get met. And that's a problem, especially if that dog, especially when you think about working with dogs with trauma and all this kind of thing, Tom, I think it's important. Uh, so I really love that. And um, and this is why it's so valuable what you do, of course, because uh, as I said at the beginning of the hour, you're very, very um, generous with your time. And I know you speak at all sorts of events. Have you just have you just come back from the States or are you going to the no, States? No, I'm going on Tuesday. Yeah, on it's Tuesday, really right. exciting, actually. Yeah, PPG, Pet Professional Guild this year, the summit is focused specifically on shelter dogs and getting them into homes so it's called homeward Great. bound um and good. yeah i'm actually talking about and then running a workshop on frustration so it should be are you good yeah, okay. really so, cool um are they putting that online at all do you know are they making that yeah i think um i think there is online tickets as well as in person uh, okay luckily looking out the window and seeing the rain i get to go in person so i'm quite looking yeah. forward to that oh, that's, yeah good um, oh that's good although you know as i've been building up to that i've been thinking about I said at the start, didn't I? Shelter is a brilliant place to create frustration. And actually, my other example that I thought of um, was airports. <laughs> because I think they're probably another great example. Everything is four times the price you expect it to be. There's queues as long as you're on everywhere you turn. There's yes. multiple gates, barriers, security checks. And and that is basically our equivalent of shelter, isn't it? <laughs> well, it is. And especially when we were, we just come back from Gran Canaria and... Um... Uh, there was some problem with uh, the staff or something. I was a strike or whatever. So they had another other non um, baggage checky in people mm. uh, who didn't know what they were doing. So we were there for like two and a half hours. And, and you just see the temper building in people because they're like, why isn't this queue not moving? Um, uh, and this is why I think, you know, I, I think we touched on quite a few important things today, Tom, especially the, connecting this notion of predictability with frustration and how important that can be. And, and actually, in some ways, if people understand these mechanisms and listen to you talking and, and educating in shelters, uh, by the very nature of the fact that the dog is there and has limited options, we do have more opportunities to provide predictability, actually, in some ways. And I, and I think it's 
I think that is kind of the key message around reducing frustration because just like you said uh, we went to Jersey recently and on the flight back uh, we boarded the plane we sat down on the plane it was all going fine then the pilot comes on and says oh there's a technical error they're just going to come and check it it'll be about 10 minutes 15 minutes later pilot comes back on and says actually you've all got to get off the plane and there's a new plane coming and we were sat you know back in departures without much information at all and you could see everybody start to build and then Member of staff comes in and says, right, okay, you can't go back on that plane. What we're going to do is bump this other flight. You'll have their plane. You'll board in 20 minutes. And you just saw everybody relax. They were still frustrated because we should have been home. But knowing that in 20 minutes' time, you're on the plane, you're moving forward, is so much better. We obviously can't do that with our dogs. So we can't say, I just need to restrain you on the table for the vet to have a look and then we'll go out and have a nice play. So what we've got to do is provide other cues for that so that we can produce some of those predictabilities and have you know safety signals in the vet that says i'm going to put this so a better example working with a dog at the minute who's struggling to have eye drops well what we don't want is a dog who sat in the kennel all day wondering when is that person going to come and do my eye drops and becoming worried or anxious or frustrated around that every time somebody walks in if we put a fluorescent jacket on when we're doing the eye drops the dog's not going to enjoy those eye drops anymore but they're probably not going to be sat spending the rest of the day thinking when are they going to come in and put those weird stuff in my eyes so thinking about how we provide that information and give people that or give the dogs that information around this is what's happening when is a really really key point and I love that notion of safety cues. You know, we, we think about cues all the time in a kind of a transactional, you do this and I'll give you this. But actually it can be really helpful to say, this happens because this is going to happen to give you a chance to think, okay, well, I can feel safe with that. Really powerful thing. So um, we mentioned earlier about simplifying shelter behavior. That's your group, of course, is uh, your page. Uh, is that the best place to kind of find more Tom or is there anywhere else people can find more Tom? Yeah, so if you go to that Facebook page, Simplifying Shelter Behaviour, um, like I said, I put out weekly videos about research to do with shelter, top tips, um, case studies, different articles, so the videos I've written stuff for people to have a look at. Uh, there's also links to previous stuff that I've done. And on Wednesday, um, so the 1st of November, we're also launching the Simplifying Shelter Behaviour podcast, uh, which is going to be experts in a range of different fields talking about shelter related behavior so you can find that on spotify um, and if you go to tinyurl.com forward slash ssb tc then you'll find it or if you go to that facebook page there's a qr code that you can just scan and hopefully go and follow and listen to the podcast on wednesday exciting and um uh are you um uh, have you got this is the podcast like a, a season or are you, it's going to be a regular thing, you know? Yeah, so the aim is that we'll have an episode out every three weeks. And like cool. I said, we're just going to be covering specifically, you know, behaviour related to shelter. But I'm sure all of the tips are going to apply to a range of things. So, um, yeah. you know, we've got a lot of different things coming up. Sarah Fisher, like you said, going to be talking about using free work and how we support dogs with that. Yeah. Um, our first episode is on dogs helping other dogs, so using dog play. Um, to meet some of the needs that we've been talking about so yeah should be really good great well thanks tom i'll uh i'll look at those things and i'll i'll, I'll just put a, a thing in the group in the chat here but i'll do a oh, separate post you. especially when it goes up onto thing well thank you so much tom it's been an amazing chat we've covered a lot tonight and um i really appreciate you coming in yeah thanks for having me it's been really good uh and um uh, got some other great conversations coming up soon. I just haven't put them up in the event thing and I can't remember them. That's what happened. It was when you come back from holiday. I can't remember. But I will do that for everybody's listening. I know we've got people who listen a lot. Um, and uh, well, thank you, Tom, very much. And I'll put the new chats in the group soon. Whatever you're doing, have a good evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are in the world. If you're listening to this on YouTube, then please hit the subscribe button. Uh, and thanks very much. Thanks, Tom. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone.